Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. My name is Brad Bollinger. I'm the publisher of the North Bay Business Journal. And thank you for being with us here today for our Cyber Resilience Virtual Summit. This is the fifth one of these we've put on, fifth annual. And this is for you. This is to help you keep your business going and thriving. And I want to thank Exchange Bank is our founding underwriter for sticking with us. This is our 15th, I think, uh, virtual event that we started doing back in April when the pandemic looked like it was going to um, make it impossible and has made it impossible to do live in-person events. We thought it was our mission to keep bringing conferences like this to the business community and our broader community. Uh, we've covered wine, we've covered health healthcare again tomorrow. And, a, a, and then a lot of awards events to keep the business community connected. And we thank you for, for being with us here this morning. This year, we broadened out our topics a little bit, uh, not a little bit, quite a bit actually, because of the nature of the time we're in. This is, yes, um, we're under constant threat for malware and ransomware and everything else, but we also have uh, the issue of the fires and the pandemic. So we broadened out the topics today to cover uh, business continuity and how you how you can plan for that. And that includes you know hardening your systems because there's just ever increasing uh, attacks on our our businesses. So we have here this morning four speakers. Uh, we're going to cover the the insurance angles. We're going to cover how to set up a business continuity plan. And then finally, uh, we're also we're going to take a, a journey on one business's uh, collection of a business continuity plan. And then uh, finally, we're going to hear about you know what systems you should have in place. Let's just take the issue of work from home. What is your what are your uh, cybersecurity uh, issues there? So once again, thank you for being with us here this morning because we have a sponsor in Exchange Bank and great support we can make this free to uh, all of the attendees. So once again, hope everybody's safe and healthy. We're gonna start off with uh, Tony Guerrero, who is a, a partner with George Peterson Insurance Agency. He uh, has been there since 2001 after a career in technology. And he was the CEO and founder of a digital media distribution company. So please join me in welcoming Tony Guerrero. Tony. Thank you, Brad. I just want to uh, thank you uh, to the North Bay Business Journal for giving me an opportunity to uh, speak with you this morning. I uh, certainly want to thank all the attendees for taking time out of their, uh, their busy schedules uh, to learn about this topic. Um, certainly an important topic, uh, more so now than, uh, than ever, I would think, uh, since we're all working from home and working remotely. Um, one moment as I'm bringing up my, okay, my first glitch here of my PowerPoint, one moment. Hmm. Okay, this is, sorry about this, I got this in rehearsal. Let's try this one more time. Hmm. Okay, well, I had a PowerPoint here and for some reason I can't bring it up. My apologies to you. So. Why don't we just go ahead and, and, and dive in? Uh, there we go. Thank you. Um, there we go. Thank you. So I, I'm assuming I don't have control of this, uh, but my apologies. So let's talk a little bit about uh, cyber liability, uh, some of the, the risk and exposures and, and coverages that are available uh, in, in the marketplace. Um, the best way to think about cyber liability is that it is uh, a blend of a crime policy, which is a type of coverage that we have in place to protect us from uh, theft of uh, money and securities, 
but certainly uh, there are limits to a, a crime policy uh, when technology and computer infrastructure comes into play. So if you're thinking about it, a cyber liability policy is broken into two primary components. The first component is the third party liability exposures. So this, those are any exposures that we have uh, or any costs that we incur or any potential disputes that we could be drawn into that are not us, not the first named insured as a result of an unauthorized breach of our systems. Uh, the second is the first party uh, losses, which are the costs that we incur uh, once we have had a security breach. And we'll talk about that. That would be uh, identification of the, the breach itself, trying to remediate the breach and, and other associated costs uh, with that. So to begin with, the first type of coverage we'll talk about is the privacy and, se privacy and security coverage. So really where this comes into play is that once we have an unauthorized breach of our systems, there are several things uh, that happen. Uh, one, we have obligations uh, for both state and regulatory environments where uh, we have to adhere to uh, certain regulations. And so the policy itself, once we have a breach, is going to trigger uh, two entities that are going to assist us in this process. One is going to be a legal entity that is going to make sure that we are complying with uh, regulatory requirements, uh, that uh, we have collected private and confidential information and we're handling it properly, um, that in the event of an unauthorized breach, uh, that we uh, notify anyone whose record has potentially been compromised, uh, should we be drawn into a dispute with uh, a regulatory body and uh, have to defend ourselves or incur fines. Uh, those are some of the third party liability exposures that we have. In addition to that, um, a third party can be impacted by our actions as well. Uh, one an example would be the uh, unintentional transmission of a computer virus. So this could be us interacting with uh, an individual that we normally do. We send an email over with an attachment. Uh, they open that attachment and we did not know that our systems were infected. And now we plant a virus or some other type of malware into their systems that bring their systems down. Uh, they identify that we were the source of the breach. Uh, they had lost revenue or customer base as a result of that and seek damages against us. The third party liability uh, endorsement on the policy would respond to those kinds of things as well. Uh, next slide, please. Regarding the regulatory environment, um, different jurisdictions have different rules. Uh, different states uh, have their own rules about how uh, we collect and we manage uh, information. Uh, if you're doing business abroad, uh, different countries may, may have different uh, regulations in place. And so the regulatory environment is one where uh, in the event we're drawn into any sort of a civil uh, or uh, domestic or foreign government entity investigation, and it is discovered that we have improperly handled or managed the data, or we didn't properly have firewalls or other protective measures uh, in place uh, as a result of something that we did or did not do, uh, individuals' records were compromised. And we could be drawn into a dispute and incur legal expenses and then third-party expenses uh, as a result of that as well. Uh, next slide, please. The second component that we have to a cyber liability policy uh, deals with the unauthorized breach response. Next slide, please. The breach response would be uh, the first part, which is our obligations. So once we have an unauthorized breach, we're obligated to do two things. Number one, we have to inform anyone whose record uh, or potential record was potentially compromised and let them know. So there would be a notification expense associated with that. In addition to that, at least in the state of California, we would be required to track the social security numbers of any individual's record who was potentially compromised. And uh, we do that so that in the event uh, someone whose record was compromised uh, becomes the victim of identity theft or something like that, it is required by law that we monitor those social security numbers and inform them and that in the event we were the source of that breach or we were the source of that identity fraud, it's our responsibility to track those social security numbers and to inform uh, anyone whose record was potentially compromised. Uh, next slide, please. In addition to uh, our regulatory response, we have computer and legal experts that would step in on our behalf 
And primarily what their job is, is to identify the, the source of the breach itself and to see if it can be rectified. And this is one of the nice things about a cyber liability policy, because once we've had a system breach and our systems are down, we really don't know what to do. And we have a team behind us that assists us in that response. One of the things that the legal experts and computer experts will do is they'll step in, identify the impact and whether or not um, the breach itself can be remediated or whether or not we have to negotiate with some sort of a cyber terrorist uh, to get our systems back. Uh, next slide, please. Cyber extortion is uh, common. I actually had a claim recently with a well-known winery here in Sonoma County. Uh, we came in on a Monday morning and unfortunately our systems were hacked. And as a result of that, uh, they filed a claim and immediately triggered a forensic IT team that stepped in and tried to identify the source of the breach itself. Um, they did that and in that process had discovered and advised our client that it would be a better course of action to uh, pay the ransom and uh, have the cyber terrorists release the encryption key so that we can have our systems come back online. That was the, uh, the, the better direction to go. So at this time, um, the cyber terrorists were uh, asking for five Bitcoins, each coin having a value of $10,000 or a $50,000 ransom to get uh, our systems back online. Uh, the IT team went in, negotiated the terms, reduced it down to one and a half Bitcoins, and then the insurance carrier uh, paid the $15,000 uh, cyber ransom. At that time, the encryption keys were released to us and our systems came back online. So that's another area where uh, the cyber ransom itself, the negotiating, all of that would be covered by a cyber liability policy. Uh, next slide, please. Again, uh, as I had said earlier, uh, cyber liability policy is a blend both of a, a crime policy and um, the extension of crime exposures that we would have with an unauthorized breach of our systems. Uh, next slide, please. So computer fraud uh, would be one area um, that would fill gaps or add perils uh, to your insurance portfolio where if an unauthorized breach of our system resulted in um, uh, uh, payments being diverted to different accounts or uh, some sort of uh, fraudulent funds transfer takes place, uh, anyone was able to grab uh, our security codes or passwords um, to be able to uh, divert funds and things like that. Those would also be covered by a, a cyber liability policy. Uh, next slide, please. Social engineering fraud is also a covered cause of loss on a cyber liability policy and it's becoming more common these days. Um, I had something like this happen with a, a brewery that I insured just a few months ago. And it was an interesting scenario, something that I was not aware could take place but a third party had jumped into an email thread between my client and one of their vendors. I believe they were a hops dealer. And out of nowhere, the email had uh, requested to our client that they were gonna deviate from the normal payment structure and requested them to wire $50,000 to a separate account. Um, this obviously raised some eyebrows from my client. Um, they took a closer look at it and had identified that the email address was missing one letter and that indeed this was coming from a third party they didn't know and was really, really uh, quite sophisticated and clever for them to be monitoring their email and jumping in on an email thread. Um, they did not wire that money, but that would be an example of social engineering fraud where someone that you're normally engaged with and someone that you normally are interacting with is, is being impersonated by a third party and essentially dupes you into wiring them money. Uh, so that indeed would be covered uh, by a cyber liability policy. Uh, next slide, please. So the third component um, is the business interruption law uh, loss uh, as a result of an unauthorized breach. Next slide, please. So business interruption um, is the net profit or loss uh, to a business uh, before taxes. And the easiest way to think of it is that uh, if our building burns, fire is a covered cause of loss. So our building burns down, we're unable to uh, continue with operations and it's gonna trigger uh, our ongoing expenses, the revenue that we're losing and uh, any of the payroll expense that we would have. You could see how when you're purchasing a cyber liability policy, you're adding a peril where now as a result of our systems going down, we're unable to operate. 
the typical deductible on a business income uh, loss like this would be eight hours. So after the first eight hours where our systems go down, um, the business interruption uh, coverage would respond uh, until we were able to remediate and get our systems back up. Next slide, please. System failure is also covered where overall, if uh, like in my winery example, our systems are down and we then have to intentionally shut down additional systems to mitigate uh, a further spread of the virus or further damage to our systems. Uh, or if there is a suspension of utilities uh, to our premises where our systems are locked down and there is a loss of revenue um, to us, it would respond to that. Additionally, if third parties are reliant on our systems for their business, and as a result of, again, something we did or failed to do, our systems go down and they suffer a loss as a result of that, uh, it would cover that as well. Next slide, please. So that's a, a, an overview of cyber liability. Uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, is that uh, each policy is different. Uh, some policies will provide certain coverages, uh, others will have exclusions, others will have sublimits. So it's important to know the, the policy that you have and in interacting with your broker, uh, making sure that they know what the risk exposures are that you have and, and properly uh, fit you with the right cyber liability policy. Uh, I hope this was informative. I apologize for being caught a little off guard here, uh, but uh, uh, thank you, Brad, and happy to answer any questions if I can. Well, well, Tony, thank you. Thank you very much. And after that little glitch at the beginning, you, it was a very interesting presentation. That's why we have these backed up on a, on a backup computer and our event manager, Tiana Sandoval, and our uh, IT person, Cole Harrison, uh, were able to bring it up for you. So Thank you. Uh, so let me let me just ask um, uh, Tony, what are you seeing in terms of the frequency of um, cyber attacks compared to say a year or two ago? Well, with the exception of the wildfires, in terms of a category, I would say that cyber liability is probably the number one category of new claims that I had, both in 2019 and 2020. Mm -hmm. So we're certainly seeing an uptick of um, unauthorized breaches and um, a lot of social engineering fraud is taking place. Mm. I gave one example. I've had multiple examples of social engineering fraud. So how would you, if you were to give a, the, our, our audience here one or two tips, if you like, uh, for you know, hardening their, their business, what, what would they be? Well, certainly if the majority of your infrastructure is cloud-based, um, then there's a degree of protection that you have there. Mm -hmm. um, internally, you may want to have uh, policies and procedures where you have your staff not saving uh, confidential information onto their desktops. Uh, once a system is breached, even though the majority of um, your intellectual property is cloud-based, if some of that material is saved on the desktops, there's exposure there. So definitely having best practices in place um, and, and making sure the, the control and monitor of confidential information that you have is secure uh, for sure. The second thing that I would recommend is know who you're communicating with. I mean, we have protocols here at George Peterson where if we have an email that comes from someone that is unfamiliar with us, uh, we not only don't click on it, but you would never click on any of the attachments or anything like that. So I think that there's just a degree of vigilance that you have to have today that you just didn't, just didn't need before. Mm -hmm. So I've always thought that there is a important HR component to cybersecurity for your business. So constant training and because like you say, you click on an email, it's got one letter. It looks like it's from the CEO telling you to move $50,000 somewhere and uh, you click on it and you know the 50 grand is gone, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it really doesn't take very much. So. So well, I want to thank you again, Tony, for being with us here this morning and for your expertise and you're out there protecting companies and advising them. And, and we want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you, Brad. You're welcome. So I just want to tell everyone what the rest of the program uh, will entail. Um, we have three additional speakers. We have Ryan Miller, who I will introduce in a minute from Portola Systems. Uh, Tracy Hall, who's in IT Assurance, uh, she's a senior manager with Wolf & Company. She's coming to us here later on from uh, Connecticut. And then finally, we'll close 
with uh, Robert uh, Lee, who is the information security officer at Exchange Bank. So next, I'd like to introduce to you Ryan Miller. Ryan is uh, Executive Vice President at Portola Systems. He has a, a BS in Organizational Behavior, Leadership and Development from University of San Francisco. And he has a comprehensive understanding of network architecture, security best practices and principles uh, that you can apply to your business. So please uh, join us in welcoming Ryan Miller. Ryan? Sorry about that, guys. Had to, had to unmute there. Thanks, Brad, for the intro. Uh, good morning. Uh, today, I am here to make sure my screen's shared. Okay, I uh, should be able to see my slide deck now. Yes, we can see it. Great. <clears throat> Top 10 vital approaches that IT can deliver as part of a uh, cyber resiliency plan. These are uh, going to be technical in nature, and we're going to cover security and availability. But hopefully I've kept these things high level enough for everybody to walk away with at least one or two immediate actions that uh, you can put in place to make your business more resilient. Uh, a bit about Portola, for those of you who don't know um, or aren't familiar, Portola's IT provider in the greater Bay Area. Focus on small and medium business, education and government industries, provide strategy, general consulting, design and management of IT systems. Um, just a little bit about what cyber resiliency is from my perspective. I like to summarize cyber resiliency as your business's ability to resist any pressure from outside forces and reduce the negative impact those outside influences can impose on things like vital services. So this is not only uh, security events that Tony covered, but also uh, natural disaster, which I think we're all too familiar with these days in Sonoma County. Um, so what's the goal? The goal from at least that from the IT perspective is that, you know, we all know customers and staff depend on these vital services that IT provide these days, more so than ever. And the goal should be um, to protect these vital services so that our businesses can keep happy customers and deliver upon the business mission. So it's important to make sure that these uh, resiliency plans within IT are always aligned to the business goals and to the business mission. Uh, within the IT department, our role in this is vital as a champion and sponsor. We want to make sure that the systems and services that the employees rely on are remaining available, accessible, and secure. And we're going to approach this resiliency plan through a holistic and systematic standpoint. Uh, so with that, let's just jump into some of the steps and processes uh, and solutions that I feel are critical to take away from today's conference. Number one, um, this is an example of a uh, kind of the end result of a BIA scorecard. I think it's something that uh, some of the other presenters will talk more about today. But um, at high level, we want to make sure that we know, document, and assess the vital systems and their dependencies. This is pretty much number one in starting the journey. Maintaining a documented inventory of the systems the software and the tools that the users rely on, uh, knowing who within the organization needs access to what and from where they need access to it, as well as what might be impacted if those systems are down. Um, and then in addition to that, identifying the dependencies between those systems. These are all things that are gonna be considered essential first steps to creating a plan. This is gonna be accomplished by executing a business impact analysis and a risk analysis together. So we conduct systems reviews, we interview the key department managers, uh, determine how they use the services, what role the services play in the execution of the business's mission. And then once we have these things defined as sort of this first step to the journey in the resiliency plan, um, the outline gets updated and documented and, and continually referenced. And it's a great foundation from which we can assess next steps and then ensure that we're right-sizing sort of the cost benefit of these protections. Um, as Tony mentioned, cloud, 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 it's a great uh, mitigation for both outages and security breaches. Um, if you haven't already started evaluating a path to retire some of the critical services that are still reliant upon physical and local systems, then I would consider this the next most important place to continue your focus after you've done this initial BIA discovery. 
um, maintaining reliable access to on-prem systems uh, and managing not only the configurations, but the security of those systems is a real challenge for any business. Um, we wanna avoid the minutia of infrastructure and you know, move what you can to software as a service. And I know that might sound funny coming from someone who makes their living uh, managing infrastructure, but in reality, IT has progressed so far. Um, and there's, there's so many other areas that we can focus that uh, infrastructure support is, is not really uh, a valuable investment for any business at this point. So continue to evaluate cloud. Um, many of us have already made this transition with things like file sync and share and email that's hosted in places like Office 365 and Google. So continuing to evaluate down the line, these line of business applications that the business depends on and then determining when, where, and how they can be migrated to SaaS. Doing it you know, early on in the plan is gonna um, help kind of evaluate and define what the foreseeable infrastructure demands are that will ultimately avoid um, the either IT consultant or the IT department making mistakes in investing money in places that have shorter lifespan like infrastructure. So if SaaS isn't an option in the immediate future, also there, are, you know, there's other options. We can host these things in places like Microsoft Azure, AWS, uh, private hosting facilities. Uh, number three is create on-site copies and remote copies. And in, in a, essence, this is, if you're not able to get away from on-prem, uh, we wanna make sure that what we do have to support and maintain is highly reliable and resilient. And the way we're gonna do this is by creating not only a local copy of those systems, and this is a simplified visibility, you probably have more redundancy in this if you have any level of server or infrastructure, but ultimately we wanna make sure we have an offline copy that's local, that if you do have a crypto event, can't be impacted by that crypto and, and can provide an easy restore point for IT to bring services back online from, uh, from a previously uninfected uh, position. And let's say it's a natural disaster and we've got uh, a fire that's taken the business out, then we wanna be able to uh, restore that service from a cloud, which means that we're gonna take those local copies and we're gonna replicate them to an offsite data center somewhere in a remote availability zone. And uh, you know, this may be a data center that is hosted in an Azure cloud, or it may be a data center that you guys uh, may lease from um, a location in Sacramento or somewhere that's out of the area if you're, if you're in Sonoma County. Um, the, the one important thing to remember within this is that we're always looking for a determination of the, what the reasonably acceptable time frame is for recovery of these standby resources. And that's gonna be something that would also be determined during your BIA. Um, you wanna make sure also in that plan that you've got things like secure remote access defined um, for the recovery site and understand the costs of also operating during the failure event because uh, there are costs that may be incurred during production. Uh, number four is, um, is, is important for everybody to know because it's not really obvious, but we want to assume that, uh, or we don't want to assume that just because everything is in the cloud that everything's safe and sound. Um, if your contingency plan is to rely on a cloud provider to protect vital services, then we're probably expecting too much out of our cloud provider. The, uh, the, the cloud-based systems as a for instance, don't necessarily include things like threat protection and intelligence that are needed to uh, protect like user inboxes uh, sort of the, preventing from those fraud instances that Tony was previously referring to. Uh, we need systems in addition to these cloud platforms that will analyze links, attachments, identify spoofing tactics with artificial intelligence, um, making sure that bad actors using uh, spoofing or fraud aren't able to compromise accounts. We wanna check security policies and ensure that the records are properly configured. Um, we wanna reduce the ability for the bad actor to spoof your domain send these fraudulent emails. Um, this slide here is an example of a check that we performed on a local business that uh, had policies that were misconfigured and unaligned. And we can see here that they had received at least eight fraudulent emails, which were all coming from Gmail accounts outside of the organization. Also, um, in addition to email, many people um, don't realize that the cloud sync can be just as susceptible to ransomware. So these are your drop boxes, your box.coms, uh, OneDrive, Google Drive, things of that nature. So there are uh, systems in place that can uh, be implemented for cloud to cloud backup. 
So this is taking your cloud backup data that maybe is synced to your desktop and is also sitting in a cloud provider and having an offline copy of that somewhere in another cloud provider that would be unimpacted by something like a ransomware. Um, the next slide, number five, is always secure user accounts. This one's relatively obvious and it's kind of a first line defense, but making sure that we've got password management and complexity requirements. There are some standards that are defined with character limitations, um, history requirements, uh, password uh, reset requirements, you know, maybe every 90 days. Most importantly, also defining a lockout policy is, is critical to, I think, any password management policy because uh, things like brute force attacks do happen. People trying to hammer on guessing a password, a bot, something of that nature. And we wanna make sure that those accounts are not susceptible to those types of attacks and that the system is configured to lock the user out when and if their password is entered multiple times incorrectly, which can be an indicator of somebody trying to uh, hack a user account. Number six, kind of playing off number five is that uh, we all know you know, strong passwords are good, but they're not enough. A single factor is not enough. So we wanna implement a second factor or also known as a multi-factor authentication mechanism. That way, should someone's password become compromised, uh, we wanna make sure that the bad actors are not able to access the system without a second factor. And without that second factor, it's really unlikely that the compromised system is gonna, is gonna be accessible. And the second factor can come in the form of things like a mobile authenticator that gets installed on a, on a mobile device. Um, it can come in the phone, form of a physical token, an email um, to a secondary account, or even an SMS message. SMS isn't the, uh, necessarily the preferred route because it too can be compromised in sort of these uh, sophisticated hacks, but it, it is certainly better than only having a single factor. Uh, number seven, so make sure that services are highly available and also mobile. And you know this one is less related to security and more related to resiliency of whether or not your internet or your facilities um, or you know the region that you're doing business in is impacted or as we're all aware, the pandemic has um, closed most of our offices due to risk. So we wanna make sure that staff is able to act, are able to access the resources they need from remote locations. Um, with you know, all of our vital applications, even in the cloud, stable internet access is 100% vital to maintaining these services. So we wanna make sure that those staff maybe have access to backed up internet. Things can be done through uh, tethering plans, MiFi devices, secondary providers um, with diverse paths, even satellite is a good option. Um, internet services don't have to match the capability of the primary internet at your business. It can be achieved at a reduced cost. So uh, remembering that this is a contingency plan is obviously a big factor. Um, it's meant to be relied on when and if the primary is down. So the level of redundancy and the cost should be sized to meet your business and your customer demands. And uh, we also wanna make sure not only the internet, but obviously the systems that are kind of down the line are also uh, resilient against failure. So looking at network, looking at power, looking at facilities, all important aspects that don't necessarily have to be overly complicated and expensive. Uh, number eight, don't leave device security to chance. So this one's really important in today's work from home scenario. So I've broken this down into three parts, actually. Um, a is going to be patch everything. Um, we have staff working with sensitive personnel and customer data beyond the perimeter of what we might consider our secure office, uh, where we have firewalls and, and protections that we've invested in traditionally. And we wanna ensure that we're maintaining good device security practices beyond that. So laptops need to be remotely patched, including not only Windows or Mac operating system patches, but most importantly, we also wanna patch the third-party applications like Java, Adobe, et cetera, that are sitting on those machines. Um, these things should be done weekly. They need to be monitored and maintained. We wanna validate them continuously by IT. <clears throat> we can see in the slide here that we literally have thousands of vulnerabilities that are discovered during a vulnerability assessment of a customer network that had roughly, I think about 30 PCs. Um, 800 of these vulnerabilities, believe it or not, were discovered across only three applications. And that's Adobe, Java, and Firefox. And many of those uh, application vulnerabilities were exploitable with 
common off the shelf software that uh, a bad actor can purchase online. So very important to make sure that those systems are continuously patched. Uh, part B of this is, you know, antivirus, it's no exception to a patching and monitoring policy. Uh, antivirus should be installed on every machine. It's kind of obvious, but I, I felt compelled to make this statement because not only should the antivirus be installed, but it should also be centrally monitored and managed, and it also needs to be patched. And the teams that are monitoring these things, whether it's uh, in-house IT or out outsourced, they need to be able to uh, receive alerts from these systems and then quickly respond if an indication of compromise is reported, even when the system is remote. Part C of this is um, making sure that we're not giving employees the keys to the front door virtually. Um, admin access is uh, generally a mistake that a lot of small businesses make because it's, it's, it's something that makes it easier for employees to install software on their machines but admin access to the local operating system should be restricted pretty much at all times and users shouldn't be able to or capable of installing programs on their own machines. So that means um, if, if laptops are part of your contingency plan and maybe you have spares that are available for dispatch or uh, maybe people are working remotely, we wanna make sure that each application is pre-installed, those, those machines are maintained and managed and that the uh, software is updated. Even if the machines aren't in use, we wanna break them out frequently and, and do a quick health check on them. Um, because restricting the admin access is gonna significantly reduce the effectiveness of the uh, malware to install or propagate across the network. Uh, number nine, we wanna protect users from internet born threats. So obvious statement, but it's, it's a little bit complicated um, to achieve. And so I, I, I'll, I'll break this down <clears throat> as best I can, but Many of us have invested in these, as I mentioned, firewall solutions that are restricting access to the physical office and the assets that sit behind that office. Um, but it, today's cloud working environment, today's work from home environment, everybody's distributed. And the investments that we've made in those firewalls are probably not providing the protection that they used to be. So the users sitting outside ultimately have access to things that they possibly didn't before on company assets. And you might not be concerned about policing the web traffic that your staff browses at home, but many of those sites are the place that harbor bad threats that can be uh, compromising. So we wanna protect the st staff's computer at what we call the DNS layer. And that's essentially the point where uh, the websites are resolved to be able to access from a machine in your web browser. And we can enforce these policies with DNS protection, which uh, sometimes is a component that gets installed with antivirus, or sometimes it's a separate uh, product that will sit on a laptop. But no matter where the laptop is physically located at that point, is if it's connected to the internet, we can ensure that the users are safe from accidentally browsing a compromised site because the DNS protection is referencing uh, databases of known good and bad sites. And it's making sure that if a user receives a link through email or if they're browsing to a site that's been compromised, the system will essentially block them from being able to access that. And that can be done both on reputation, um, meaning a site that's known to be compromised by one of these thousands of databases that are out on the internet, or it can be done by content, meaning that we don't want them to go to certain websites maybe that are explicit in nature or known to be harbors of bad actors. And the last slide, um, never underestimate the power of knowledge here. We want to train staff. Tony touched on this a little bit. I'm sure others will as well. It's, it's very critical. Uh, we, want to, we, we want our staff to have a keen eye to be able to detect things like that uh, missing character in an email thread or an injection of the, uh, the bad actor into, uh, into an email inbox. And um, if, if the tools that we have in place for some reason aren't 100% effective, the last line of defense is always going to be the user trying to make sure that they don't engage. Um, so we want to make sure that they're aware of policies and procedures that are in place, ensure you know, a smooth transition from working in normal conditions to a contingency system when people are more exposed than any, any other time. Um, these include you know, things like access to the systems that people need to work, 
the proper handling of data, um, awareness of policies, even at a high level to protect your, your, not only your employees, but also your customers. And uh, we want to implement these policies and procedures, document them in locations that are accessible online and offline. That way, if our systems are down or if we don't have access to them, people have something that's uh, easily referenceable. And we want to definitely implement a user uh, security awareness policy and train the staff on acceptable use of the technology and kind of the tips and tricks to look for when and if they might be exposed to a compromise. Um, and then most importantly, we want to check in with staff and recertify their knowledge on a, on a consistent basis. These things are complicated. They transition, technology evolves, our working conditions change. So having at least an annual check-in and some reminders for staff on uh, you know, the, the best practices for security is important. And then absolutely including these on onboarding processes. We've seen a lot of businesses recently that have um, you know, had ch changes in staff and maybe haven't considered the fact that while the working conditions that we once had are different uh, and now we're bringing people on in a new circumstance and uh, we wanna make sure that they're trained the same way that staff were when they were working in the office. So that covers it for uh, the 10 resilient tips that I have for you today. Um, I know I, I went pretty fast through a lot of those, but if you have any questions, you can certainly reach me at the email address here. Well, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Fascinating presentation. Um, thank you for the, the structure, the top, the top 10 tips. So thank you. Let me, I'm going to ask you the same questions I asked um, Tony, and that is, what is the level of threat that you see out there today? Is it increasing or uh, are businesses more vulnerable today than, than say the last couple of years? Yeah, it's certainly increased. I think, you know, in terms of businesses being more vulnerable, Brad, I would say yes. And I think in a large part, that's due to the change in working environment. Yes. Um, these threats that exist today, the, the FBI actually just released a, uh, a notice that even the County of Sonoma had a briefing on um, that was outlining a recent attack on a lot of healthcare organizations yes. known as Ryuk. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, if you read through some of the history in Ryuk, it's actually been around and very prevalent since 2016. And so I don't think that the, the number of attempts has increased. I think that people are more exposed because they're working in a condition that they're not familiar with. So that's where I think training people, having systems in place that can uh, provide precautions are more important than ever. And then as I asked Tony, what are one or two things that a business or organization can do to uh, harden its, uh, its business? Well, you know, everybody's working remote right now, as I mentioned. Yep. So the one slide that I covered with respect to making sure that their machines are patched, I mean, we saw how many vulnerabilities existed in that. And, yeah. you know, I can't stress how easily uh, those things can be compromised. Yeah. So making sure that the endpoints are protected, number one. Um, number two, making sure that we've got second factor of authentication is absolutely critical because it's very okay. easy to accidentally click on a link. And, and uh, you know, make your system exposed by releasing your password. Um, mm -hmm. Those are those are really really I think critical to today's. And then just train, train, train. Yeah. To, to see that list with that Dropbox and Adobe on it, you know, I use those every day pretty much. Yeah. So it's yeah, like it's... so uh, so really it's a, it's a matter of we're all working from home right now. I'm in my study, uh, and what what are the main threats there just to I know you've mentioned them but I think they bear repeating yeah so I think the main threats that people are going to be exposed to is is really email born typically okay right? we're going to have a lot of that and then I mentioned that a lot of people now are bringing their laptops home or there's a lot of businesses that we've been working with that have encouraged staff to use their personal computers which uh, home offices don't have the same protection that the business has at invested in over the years Mm -hmm. at maybe the data center or at the local um, office. So okay. we want to make sure that those endpoints that even the end users are, are using have some level of filtration so that they're not able to go out to those bad sites. So right. that DNS protection is important. Um, that's, I think, one thing that can be done to improve the work from home environment. Well, I want to thank you for being with us this morning, Ryan. I, I, I presume you're really, really busy. Right yeah. Now, uh, I would guess. And uh, 
we should thank all of our IT people, which you know have been so critical in this pandemic to keeping people working. And uh, thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for having me, Brad. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you again, Ryan. So our next speaker is Tracy Hall. She is a senior manager in the Information Technology Services Group for Wolf and Company, coming to us again out of Connecticut here this morning. Uh, Tracy is one of the leading business continuity planning experts in the country with over 20 years of experience. So we're very lucky to have Tracy here with us this morning. Welcome, Tracy. Hello, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay, perfect, perfect. And you can see the screen, correct? Yes, I can see the, see the screen. Excellent, you're, you're good. thanks thank so you. much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so thank you for having me um, here today from the very chilly um, East Coast within Connecticut. I was uh, telling the group earlier today that it's um, a, a high of 35 degrees today and sandwiched in between two weekends that are gonna be almost 70. So it's our very um, strange time of year for, um, for weather for sure. Um, so I'm gonna spend the next 15 minutes or so talking a little bit about um, what we're referring to as our business continuity management toolkit. Um, and I say business continuity management um, because there's been a shift in the industry from looking at it from just um, business continuity planning it, and more so on a proactive approach of business continuity management and being more resilient to the things that, that may cause outages for us um, in the future. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I Just a little bit more about my background. So I've been doing business continuity and disaster recovery planning for um, over 20 years now. And I have been with Wolf and Company for seven of those um, tw over 20 years. And we, uh, just for those of you who do not know about Wolf and Company, we've been around for over a hundred years. Um, Wolf and Company PC, obviously it's a, um, a CPA firm, but I can assure you that I don't know numbers. Um, I have a fifth grader and an eighth grader and they know not to come for me for math homework help. So um, that's why I sit in the risk management division, which is actually now the biggest division within our company. Um, and we are shifting to a lot more of consulting type of focus. Um, we are headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts. We've got offices in Springfield, Massachusetts, Albany, New York, Livingston, New Jersey, but we also have representatives throughout the country um, who are resident in, in different states. And we are now over 300 professionals. So that's a little bit more um, about the background. Um, and I talked about myself and, and you know, I, I understand that, you know, I always say to people, I know that I'm the one who's most excited about this topic than anyone else in the room, but I think it's a very important topic to talk about, especially because of all of the events that have gone on within 2020. So if we talk a little bit about um, the importance of BCP, um, this is a, a slide um, that I use in a lot of my public speaking and I updated it um, earlier this year, obviously um, you'll notice that the word pandemic does not show up here. And I wanted to make sure that I made the, um, the reference to that in saying that when we talk about business continuity as a whole, um, we, this has been a really interesting year. It's been the busiest of my career. Um, I've been talking about pandemic planning um, since about 2006. And I have absolutely been known to say that it's probably never going to happen in our lifetime, but it's something that we have to take a look at. But I wanted to make the distinction that when we talk about business continuity, pandemics is a very um, unique situation. It's not one of high probability and it's not a typical BCP event. Um, in that it doesn't affect any of our data centers. It's not affecting our locations except for stay at home orders where people aren't going into the office, but it's not a typical event that we, we usually plan for. So when we look at this and we talk about, well, what are the, the top causes of downtime? You'll, and at the bottom, I have a note here that percentages are combined across categories a little bit, meaning that um, human error may cause hardware failure, cyber attack may cause hardware failure, et cetera. 
But what I wanted to point out that is that when people prior to um, COVID would talk about business continuity and disasters, they always talked, you know, they thought about these large scale disasters. Obviously, 9-11 back in the day was the big one. But Hurricane Katrina, for instance, um, you know, the wildfires, which are certainly a big thing that we have to, to think about. But Notice where those fall on this scale. And this kind of stands true. And I, we've got a lot going on about global warming and how this is going to change the nature of what we do as professionals in this field. But it stands true that natural disasters are still sort of at the, the bottom of what we need to be thinking about for planning. We want to think about things that are location specific, um, you know, that that affect us, but not the customers that they that we serve because they're expecting business as usual. A couple other um, really interesting facts that, you know, statistics that, again, kind of stand the test of time. 93% of businesses that experience downtime of 10 days or more file bankruptcy within one year. I would argue that as time goes on, that to find a business that can be out for 10 days or more is, is shrinking, right, because of the competitive nature of, of the world that we live in. But then 40% of businesses that are severely compromised go out of business within six months. And it's probably safe to say that these statistics come from companies that don't have a well thought out plan um, to continue business in, in the event of an adverse event that, that affects them. So if we bring it back to the beginning, um, I know that the two speakers before me have talked about the business impact analysis or the BIA is what we commonly refer to it as. Um, and again, just to reiterate what was said earlier, um, this is the process of meeting with all of the business units um, and starting at the function level and identifying and prioritizing those business functions and the resources required to support them in predefined recovery times. So, you know, to say within 24 hours after an event, what, what things would you need up and running? And again, it's not, not just about the functions themselves. We really wanna drive into what resources that support those functions need to be up and running so that they can continue, right? Um, and we do this at the function level, we talk about it at the department level. Eventually, um, you know, we do some analysis around the technologies or the systems that support the business. And then we wanna be able to have an enterprise-wide look at, you know, okay, if we were to go down, what needs to be up in 24 hours across the entire organization, not just within a particular business unit. Risk assessment. Risk assessment is a very big piece of this, um, of this, this, the foundational element of a business continuity plan. And usually these are done location by location. And it identifies um, probability of threats affecting the organization and impact if they were to occur. So if you were to take a fire, you know, what is the probability that a fire could happen without any controls being put in place? Because that's the, the second piece of it. You know, if we didn't have fire suppression systems and we didn't have sprinkler, you know, all of the things, fireproof cabinets and doors, what is the probability that this could happen? And what would the impact rating be if it were to occur prior to those controls being put in place. And then we would go through and document what controls are in place and what do we believe the control environment rating would be to determine if we have enough controls put in place for the things that would most likely cause an outage um, at the organization. Scenario-based planning is, is becoming a big thing again. Um, you know, it kind of vacillates. So about 10 or 15 years ago or so, it was all about worst case scenario. How do we, um, let's build a plan that's just on worst case scenario. And although I still will take that approach in my consulting engagements with thinking that let's start with worst case because anything that is less than worst case, you have the ability and the tools to recover from that. But what you do want to make sure that you're doing is that you're incorporating different scenarios in your, in your planning. Um, I usually group them in, in things that impact um, facilities, personnel, or systems, or a combination of more than one of those. Um, you know, like I say here, fire could have the potential to impact your facility your personnel and your systems. 
um, the pandemic. It's typically just a personnel issue, although we know that this has been very different than anything that we've planned for in the past, um, you know, from a pandemic planning standpoint. But making sure that you've explored the different scenarios in your, in your risk assessment as far as the threats go, and maybe having some language within the plan to say, we've gone through you know, discussion on a variety of different scenario types and, and incorporate regional events as well, which the pandemic can technically fall into, um, but, but things like wildfires and large storms, et cetera, should be incorporated into that thought process as well. Technology recovery. This is the big piece that everyone, when they think about business continuity and disaster recovery, it's it's the obvious one, right? How do we keep our systems up and running or how do we recover them if they go down? Um, we wanna make sure that all of the systems are accounted for, you know, based off of those BIA results. Have we taken especially all of our critical systems and incorporated them into our recovery strategy or are there systems that we identify um, in that BIA process that we say, you know what, we don't have a redundant strategy for this. So we cannot um, support the, the business unit request of a 24 hour or a 12 hour uptime for that system because we don't have the proper infrastructure to do so. Um, making sure that you know, your resources are available um, to successfully meet the recovery time objectives set forth in that BIA. One of the things, um, so making sure you have adequate hardware and software, sufficient bandwidth, do you have the personnel to make that happen? And one of the things that I always like to point out is when you're doing um, the BIA and determining what the recovery times for systems are, if you say something has to be up in 12 hours, you need to make sure that the dependencies for that system or the infrastructure requirements can be up prior to restoring that system. So that has to all be taken into account as well. It's not just the one system, it's all of its dependencies. Personnel recovery, um, have a well thought out and documented strategy for where your employees are gonna work from. Now this is changing here in 2020 and I actually, you know, it's, it's something that I'm putting on my radar and talking to my clients about because one of the things that concerns me is now that everybody's working to, you know, moving to a remote fashion, um, what's the, what is going to happen if there is a regional event that takes out power? And what I'm hearing a lot of companies say is, you know, we may downsize our footprint for our real estate in our production location and not pay for rent because everyone can work from home. And that's fine. Um, I completely support that. But what you have to um, identify is what is the risk if you have people in your geography that are working and maybe there's a widespread power outage, which does not allow them to do that. What is the plan for that? What's the backup for your employees when they actually can't work from home, which is now their primary location? Communications, making sure you have a well thought out communication plan. Has to, communication has to be timely. It's not just for the onset of the incident, it has to give updates ongoingly. You have to understand what the right frequency is so that you're not overwhelming people and you're not underwhelming people with information coming from you. Making sure that you have multiple communication vehicles, you know, phone, text, social media, email, so in case one is unavailable, you do have some backups. How do, do you know how to get to your contact list and what's the frequency of contact information updates who has the responsibility to kick off these communications and do they have the right tools to do so? And making sure that your external communications um, should include a level of assurance. So when you're speaking to the public, when you're speaking to your customers, when you're speaking to the media, make sure that you're including a clause that says that their information is safe, okay? So that they know that they haven't lost anything that, they, that, that you're holding for them. Outsourcing and third-party providers is a big thing now. We all outsource. So revisiting critical vendor due diligence, you know, making sure you understand what their backup plans are, um, how to create workarounds if you've got, for instance, in the pandemic, if you have staffing shortages that impact any of the products and services that your vendors supply to you. Um, tracking third, party third parties geographically. This became really big in 2020 
anybody out there who's tried to get laptops or any other type of equipment, um, you know, even at home, things uh, for your outdoor activities um, were very hard to come by. And a lot of it was because the, the manufacturing plants were in pandemic hotspots. So what was the backup for those manufacturers to get us the product when they had to shut those plants down? And then just making sure how interruptions may impact contractual obligations. Um, earlier, we heard about business interruption insurance that rang a bell to me because you can collect if you have an if your third parties have an obligation to you that they are not able to satisfy. Cybersecurity, I don't think I have to go into a lot of detail with all of the discussion that's been here, but just make sure that, you know, we understand that cyber attacks could cause business continuity and disaster recovery situations, making sure that they're included in the BCP um, risk assessment, make sure you're cross-referencing cross your business continuity plan and your incident response plan so that, you know, if, if there's something that's being said in your BCP, it mirrors exactly what the escalation plan would be in the incident response plan. Testing, this is a big thing, um, making sure that, you know, it's, it's a big area of focus right now, making sure you have dynamic testing, multi-year test plans, um, rotate technologies that are varying in criticality, um, making sure that you're including the supporting infrastructure in your testing, and it really needs to be built off of that most current business impact analysis. And to finish up here, um, ongoing maintenance, um, making sure that your, your plan is being revisited at least yearly. Anytime you have any big changes within your organization, or they may even be to what seems like small changes, making sure that your business continuity plan is living and growing and changing according to your business. Um, a lot of times I've done engagements with clients who come back to me five or six years later and say, Tracy, we almost have to start from scratch because we haven't touched this plan since you left and it's now completely out of date. So that's a really big thing. It's a living document. It's a living program and it needs to be treated as such. So any questions on that? Um, anything I can answer? Pandemic, not pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you for being with us uh, here today. So I that number 93% of businesses that are closed for 10 days file bankruptcy a year later or whatever it was, it's pretty, pretty stunning. So mm -hmm. your, your business is on the line here. So uh, I'll ask you the same questions I asked of Tony and Ryan just for continuity here. Uh, and that is uh, in your 20 years of experience in doing this is, is what has the importance of business continuity planning increased in the last couple of years? And, and do you see it increasing? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if I would say in the past couple of years, but what I can tell you is there has been a gradual increase in importance to this. And there's a couple of factors. Um, we work in a lot of regulated industries. So financial institutions, um, healthcare companies who have a regulatory component um, that keeps growing um, in order to have this. And then, um, you know, the other thing that I'm seeing from non-regulated industries, like let's say manufacturing distribution, is that their clients are now really pushing and asking for proof that they have a program. Yeah. And okay. it's not just sign on the dotted line that you do. They actually want mm -hmm. evidence that you can mm -hmm. continue business. And then just as I asked Tony and, and Ryan, that, well, I just mentioned that in this pandemic, the things that companies are doing uh, like we're doing virtual events here. Uh, we've just had the CEO of a large uh, organic food company with us. The things that they're doing inside the company now will impact them for years to come. Uh, Absolutely. Around what they had to do to keep their employees safe, to, you know, to meet this, had a, you know, a huge rise in demand for their products. Anyway, so the two things that uh, companies or organizations can do to, to get their, their continuity plans up and running? 
Um, yeah, so I think one of the biggest things is absolutely look at the lessons learned from 2020, but don't forget that this is a very atypical event. You have to bring it back to that business impact analysis and make sure that you understand and uncover every single rock as to what needs to be in your program. And then the employee relocation thing, I think, is a big thing because I think a lot of us are going to rely on people just working remotely. Mm -hmm. And it just concerns me based on your geography and where people yes. might be yes. affected in the masses. I know that, that we're, our whole company is working remotely. And one of the things we did was uh, offer a deal on generators that people could, you know, in case we had a power. But that's really a patch. You know, I mean, it was good yeah. to do, but it's a patch. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, this morning, and I'm uh, sorry, it's 35 degrees in, in Connecticut. I don't know, it's, it's raining. It'll be 70 by Saturday. So. There you go. Thank you so much, Tracy. Really appreciate it. No, thank it. you. Okay. Well, thank you, Tracy. Our, our final speaker here this morning is Robert Lee, who is the Information Security Officer at Exchange Bank. Uh, Robert has been a great partner in this conference. Uh, this year and, and previously, he has over 10 years of public and private sector experience in information security gov gov governance, risk and compliance. And he's going to take us through uh, their own um, business continuity journey. So please welcome Robert Lee. Thank you, Robert. Good morning, Brad. How are you, sir? Very good. Thank you. Good. Do this. Share my screen. Can you see my screen? Brad? Yes, I can see it. Great, thank you. So good morning, everyone. Thank you attendees uh, for attending this morning's virtual summit, as well as thank you so much to our presenters, uh, Ryan Miller from Portola Systems, Tony Grove from George Peterson Insurance, as well as Tracy Hall from Wolf and Company. So Exchange Bank has, as Brad indicated, an underwriter and sponsor uh, for the past five years for this summit. So I thought that what better than the underwriter of this event, of this summit, to present our resilience journey. So I'm going to take you through our resilience journey at, at a very high level and uh, what, what uh, is in the future for us uh, in, in our ever ongoing uh, resilience journey. So briefly, I'll talk about our bank, the security team, risk management department, past, present, and future. So a little bit about our bank. Our bank was founded in 1890, was established by Frank Doyle. Our bank is a community bank focused on Sonoma County. And what's unique about our bank is we have the Santa Rosa Junior College Frank Doyle Scholarship Fund. So 50% of our dividends go towards that scholarship fund. Bank has roughly 19 locations and about 400 employees, and we have approximately $3 billion in assets. The information security team is comprised of currently two people. One is myself, I'm security officer. As Brad had mentioned, uh, I have several years of experience. I was previously the IS manager at a local city and a ISO or information security officer in local government. I hold varying amount of certifications and I have a master's in information security. Part of the team, we also have Lyndon. He is a network administrator. He also has various uh, technical certification. He also has about 10 years of network administrator experience. So the information security team is part of the risk management department. So risk management department, it's pretty self-explanatory. We manage we, and we assess risk bank-wide. That could be cybersecurity, business continuity risk, operational risk, and also we have an internal audit department. Well, it's helpful to know what is resilience from the exchange bank side, right? So three things. Number one, resuming operations during a disaster recovery, disaster recovery or a business continuity event. Two, resumption during an operational degradation. As Tracy and other presenters have mentioned, things like physical, uh, physical site outage, power outage, network interruption. Um, so we plan and we're resilient for that. Also assisting our customers during their respective disaster recovery or business continuity event. 
So in the past, Exchange Bank has had to be resilient for these events, things like a flood, an earthquake, power outages, and an internet or connectivity issues, right? We've all faced this, et cetera. We've been resilient in this uh, manner um, because we have multiple redundant backup systems. We have multiple redundant connectivity throughout our branches on our main sites. But in addition to these events, we've also had to prepare for the present. So of course, other presenters has mentioned COVID-19, 40 California counties in massive rollback as COVID-19 cases double in 10 days, is the most recent news. Wildfires. So this table right here is actually coming from Cal Fire. And as you can see from January 1st to November 15th, we've actually had 7,602 wildfires this year statewide. Last year, January 2019 to November 15, 2019, 6,660. Presently, one of the events, cyber attacks. As Ryan had mentioned, there's been credible uh, ransomware threats against US hospitals and actually other uh, sectors as well. So this screenshot is essentially just a sample of typical ransomware that comes in hijacks and rans uh, deploys malicious software or content onto a network. And then that's where the malicious person uh, demands a ransomware or a ransom. So earlier things that in which we have to be resilient for, I'm sure everyone's heard about this in the news, murder hornets in the United States that's uh, affected uh, honey production. Traces of a bubonic plague found in California for in the, the past, the first case in five years. And my personal favorite, as reported by the North Bay Business Journal, Northern California officials worry, worry of solar storm threat to the grid. That has the potential to affect things like transformers, electronic transformers, uh, backup generators, ATM machines, and the like. So with that, all these particular events, right, in which we have the Brazilian for, what do we do? How do we prepare for that? So first and foremost, take a, take a, um, take a template from Snoopy. First of all, breathe. <laughs> when you breathe, you're more focused and then you can better coordinate and, and handle the journey before you. So as Tracy had mentioned, others had mentioned, definitely make part of the resilience journey and our resilience journey the BIA or bis business impact analysis, as well as the BCP or business connectivity plan. What we do at the bank is we also use a methodology called people process technology. And I have it here on the screen. You may have already seen this in previous webinars, summits, et cetera, and the like. So people process and technology. So people, lifeblood of any organization, right? Our employees is what makes our business tick. Exchange Bank is no exception. Our people is what makes the bank, right? So as Tracy and some others have mentioned, are our people safe? Are they, are, are they secure? Are they being trained properly, right? So during the wildfires, for example, we made sure we reached out to our employees and made sure they're safe. If they were displaced, did they need some assistance? Things of that nature. Process. So if a process that's automated or semi-automated is unavailable, what is the backup process, right? And also goes to a people. If a person is not available or is displaced, is there a secondary? And the same thing with the process. Is there a primary process and is there a secondary process? And third, technology, right? Ryan Miller had mentioned SaaS as well as hosted infrastructure. So if the technology is not available, that totally impacts your people's ability to perform and the process as well. So I mentioned people, process, and technology because it helps with the BIA, the business impact analysis, as well as the business continuity plan. So we at the bank, we definitely have a business impact analysis. We take people, processes, and technology into consideration. We develop that questionnaire. We work with the various departments to say, what, what do you need operationally if there is an event, any type of event, cyber events, wildfire, natural, et cetera. So after 
we complete the BIA, we develop recovery strategies. And so I think Tracy mentioned this as well. What is the RTO? What is the RPO? What is the recovery time and recovery point objectives? Then we develop the plan. And most importantly, we test and exercise. I want to make sure everyone on the summit recognizes this. Exercise, exercise, exercise. As Tracy mentioned, testing. But exercise, exercise, exercise. Um, I wish that we could outsource our exercise that some people can actually lead. That's a, an outsource of your organization. However, the organization should definitely exercise, exercise, exercise uh, their business continuity plan. So in the future, everyone talks about this new normal of what we're facing, right? So for our future here at the bank, what we're focusing on is further integration with FFIEC. An FFIEC uh, provides direction to a lot of the financial institutions. Uh, they provide guidance, documentation, et cetera. And they have new releases of their, their guide in terms of business continuity, pandemic planning, et cetera. We're in compliance with FFIEC and we're looking at further integration with their new guidance that, that came out earlier this year. Other, number two, further strengthening of our mode access program. So Ryan Miller um, and Tracy, I think, honed in on this as well, is that we are continuing to see an increase of remote access uh, due to the pandemic, et cetera. So we're looking at further strengthening our remote access program. Number three, we're leveraging more cloud and thir third parties um, more. And so I think we'll start to see that. So I want to mention third parties as well. So Tracy mentioned vendor management. That's what I mean by third parties. So we're outsourcing or looking at outsource some key functions. How does that look like, right? If in which we're establishing relationship with, do they have the appropriate security controls, right? What is their business continuity strategy? And number four, climate change. Climate change is affecting different markets, different vectors, different sectors. And so how does that impact our bank specifically? So lessons on our journey. Number one, revisit your BCP plan at least annually, or if there is a process or system has a major change. It doesn't have to be technology. If you've updated from one process to another process, that definitely begs to revisit your BCP plan. Communicate early and often. That could be to your stakeholders, other department managers, the executives, the board, et cetera. How is their BCP plan going? Does it need um, some more attention? Does it need a rewrite, et cetera? As Tracy mentioned, definitely this is a living and breathing document. Number three, plan for most events. Definitely you can group some events together. For example, cyber events. That could be anything from a malicious attack, social engineering, et cetera. The other, natural disasters, earthquakes, wildfires, floods, et cetera. Number four, review your insurance policy annually. Folks like Tony Guerrero can definitely help out in that regard. So we wanna make sure that your business continuity plan also uh, includes any provisions for your insurance policy and where the insurance policy in your broker or provider can assist. Number five, review your cybersecurity posture minimally every quarter. So folks like Ryan Miller at Partola Systems can definitely help in that regard. Right? You wanna make sure that you're prepped for the latest cyber event that may come down into your organization. And number six, as I've mentioned, exercise, exercise, exercise your business continuity plan. So everyone on the call, everyone on the summit should remember one thing. We are not all in the same boat. Different people may have different boats. We are all in the same storm together. All four of us that are presenters today can reach out to us, more than happy to help uh, with your cyber resilience journey. Thank you, and I will take questions. Thank you, thank you so much, Robert, for, for sharing that with us. And I was reminded as I was listening to you, there's an eerie TED talk, you can Google it, um, uh, Bill Gates in 2015, uh, saying that the, the biggest threat to the, the world economy was a pandemic. 
and no one paid any attention to it. And, and so here we are. And then you mentioned climate change is going to have a, a, an impact on, on our businesses, maybe all of them in one fashion or another. So thank you again for that presentation. And I'm gonna ask you for continuity again, uh, the, the same questions I asked the three presenters uh, before you, and that is, uh, are you seeing an increase in, in the importance of business continuity planning uh, going forward? Absolutely. The business continuity planning, the, another way of, of looking at this is that most organizations pre-pandemic, they had a safety plan, right? They had a fire drill, they had an organizational get the heck out of the building type thing, that type scenario, right? So you already have some of that culture or that um, organizational culture already. So adapt to that, right? So your business continuity planning um, is, is a shift. You put that together. But again, the key here is after you have your business continuity plan, exercise, exercise, exercise. You have to test that plan. And the reason for that is you're looking for gaps or vulnerabilities in that plan. Yeah, yeah. And then as I asked the others, what are two things you would tell uh, businesses and organizations out there to do to start, if they haven't started the journey, uh, to, to start it or continue it? Well, number one, definitely know that you're not alone. Right. Um, it it's, it can it can be a daunting task. So take a step back, breathe, and know that you're not alone. Any of the presenters can definitely help you out. Start on that resilience journey. So that's the first thing. You know, the second thing is definitely talk with your employees. Talk with people. As I mentioned, there's people, process, technology. Definitely, mm -hmm. your people are the key. They're the lifeblood of your business. So make sure they're trained make sure they're aware of the business continuity plan and whatever contribution they have to that organization, right? Yeah. Training is definitely important. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Miller from Portola definitely talked about cybersecurity controls. Definitely important. Having that multi-factor is, mm -hmm. is vital, is critical um, uh, for an additional uh, minimal security control. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, Robert, for that presentation. And thank you for supporting this conference. It actually, um, the leadership of the bank came, I, I'd like to take credit for uh, creating this conference. It's actually, I believe this is an important topic for our community and it, it certainly is. And, you know, we don't know how many attacks we've prevented. Um, we, there's no way of knowing that, but I think it, we, we succeeded in increasing awareness of how important it is to harden your systems. And now to really in the more broader sense, but all these multiple threats to have a, a solid business continuity plan in place. So thank, thank you again for being with us this morning. So I want to thank all of our presenters, uh, Tony, Brian, Tracy, and Leslie Robert here. I want to thank Exchange Bank for supporting this conference so that all of you could attend it uh, free of charge. Uh, this um, recording of this will live on our, our website and uh, it'll be up there soon. And I want to thank all of you that attended here today. And everyone stay safe, stay six feet apart, and wear a mask. We're going to get through this. Thanks so much.